So now we can look at um, Gibbs free energy. So we're really trying to answer the question, is this reaction going to be spontaneous? And you can tell that just by looking at the sign of delta G. Delta G has two main components to it. You have an enthalpy term and you have an entropy term. Um, and because of what we define delta G based on what's happening with the entropy of the universe, we can just look at the sign of delta G to tell whether or not the reaction is spontaneous or not. So if delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. If it's positive, then it's non-spontaneous in the forward direction. It's spontaneous in the reverse direction. So the reaction can only proceed spontaneously in one direction. So if you want to know if the reaction is spontaneously as it's written, you're looking for negative delta G. So negative delta G means it's spontaneous. Let's write that down. So, uh, delta G is negative, it's spontaneous. That's kind of the important message here. Um, if it's positive, that means it's non-spontaneous in the forward direction. Um, you can also look at Q and K to figure out whether the reaction is proceeding um, in, uh, in which direction is the reaction proceeding. Um, so if K is greater than Q, it's spontaneous in the forward direction. If K is less than Q, it's spontaneous in the reverse direction. We're going to look at this again um, closer to the, the end of the chapter when we're looking at delta G under non, um, non-standard conditions. So whenever you see, just a reminder, whenever we see the superscript zero up, up on top, um, that means you're under standard conditions, and we'll talk more about those in a bit. So let's see if we can use that equation, delta G is delta H minus T delta S, to solve for delta G. If you're, we're going to have a lot of delta G equations. Um, the one that you use really depends on what kind of information you're given. If you are given a delta H and a delta S and a temperature, then you definitely want to use this equation, delta G naught, delta H minus T delta S, and just want to plug everything in. You want to be careful with your units, so watch your units. Uh, you'll see that delta H is usually in kilojoules and delta S is usually in joules. So I'm going to do all of this in kilojoules. So the only one I really have to change is the delta S. Uh, so if we had 132, I could just say that there's 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So that becomes 0 0.132 kilojoules per kelvin. Okay, so that's our delta S naught. So then the rest we can just plug in. So we have delta G naught is delta H 24.6 that's in kilojoules minus T which is 298. Make sure your temperature is in kelvin and delta S is going to be 0.132 kilojoules per kelvin. So you're Kelvins are going to cancel, you'll end up with something in uh, kilojoules. So you just multiply these two and then take the 24.6 minus whatever you get there, and you end up with like negative 14.7 kilojoules. So this is going to be um, spontaneous because delta G is negative. So this is going to be spontaneous. So you can look just right at the sign to tell whether or not the reaction is going to be spontaneous. So this is a very kind of straightforward problem, just plug and chug. If you know delta H and delta S and T, just plug it all into this equation and solve for, for delta G, and then you just look at the sign. So the only thing you really have to be careful with is your units, make sure everybody's in the same units. And it doesn't matter if you go to joules or in kilojoules. Delta G and delta H are usually in kilojoules, and S is usually in joules. So as long as you label your units, then you're fine. Um, standard, so when we were talking about uh, that superscript zero, right? That standard standard conditions. What are what do we mean by standard conditions? It just means that if you if you have a solid, it's a pure solid. If you have a liquid, it's a pure liquid. If you have a gas, then the uh, it's at a pressure of one atmosphere. And if you have a solution, the concentration is one molar. Um, elements are always going to have a delta G. That F means it's a formation reaction. You can't really form an element from other elements, so the delta G of formation for an element in its most um, standard state is going to be zero. So we're going to start looking things up in tables. So these delta G F's are, uh, are in a table. Um, everything's under standard conditions. Um, so if you notice, temperature is not really listed as the standard condition. Usually we're going to do this at 298 Kelvin. So if I forget to put a temperature down, it's probably I probably meant to do 298 Kelvin. Um, 
so let's see. So this is a, if if all if they want to find delta g, this is another way to find delta g naught using a table. And so the table is in the back of the book. You can also um, just Google thermodynamic data table, and you'll get something like this. And it'll have uh, elements. It'll have compounds. It's it's it's, it's kind of hard to find some of these sometimes. Um, it's by the main group element. So if you wanted to find, um, I don't know, something, you know water here is under hydrogen. Um, be careful with the phase of matter. So liquids are going to have different values than, than gases. Um, you have H, G, and S values in here. If all you're looking for is delta G, then you're just looking at that middle column. And you look up these numbers, and then you plug it into that equation. That's pretty much all we're going to do. Products minus reactants. If you have stoichiometric coefficients, like down here, we have a 2 here, we have a 2 here, you want to make sure you incorporate that into this problem. That's what the N and um, the MR, the stoichiometric coefficient. So as long as you don't get confused with your reactants and your products, it will be fine. Um, and again, this is just, just plug and chug. So this, these are your reactants and these are your products. Um, and so you're going to look these values up in a table and you don't have to memorize any of them. I'll always give you, um, I'll always give you the table. So let's see, um, I'll, I'll write it out in a generic form first. Um, Delta G of this reaction, we're looking at these formation, um, the delta G of formation for each one of these things. So I want two times whatever the delta G of formation is under standard conditions for water. Um, two because it has a stoichiometric coefficient of two plus one of the carbon dioxide. Those are my products, and I'm going to subtract out the reactants of my CH4 and two times the delta G of formation of the O2. Now the O2 is an element, so that's going to be zero, so I don't have to worry about that. What you do want to, and I mentioned it a little bit ago, make sure that when you look up the value for water, you're looking up um, what it is for the gas. So when you go to the table, again, um, if you're under hydrogen, right, you look up gaseous water here, delta G of formation, um, negative 228.6. So I think in, I used a different number from the back of the book. So if you're using the back of the book, um, you might get slightly, slightly, slightly different numbers just because the tables online are a little more up to date. So that's how you find the numbers. I'll, I'll just show you what they are from uh, the back of the book. And I don't care which ones you use. Just when you're checking your homework, if you are off by just a little bit, that's probably what it is. You used a different table. Um, than the one in the back of the book, which is fine. On the exam, everyone will have the same, the same uh, tables. 57, uh, and these are all in uh, kilojoules. Yeah, carbon dioxide was negative 394.4. So you want to do this in baby steps, and just be careful with your signs. This is negative 50. Point eight, and this is two times zero. Element uh, oxygen is going to be zero. I think I'll just show you that in the table. Um, if you look up oxygen, O2 gas, zero for for delta G formation. Okay, so when you work all of this out, delta G naught should end up being around negative eight hundred point seven kilojoules. And sig fig, since we're adding and subtracting, we're just looking at the number of decimal places. So there's only one one place after the decimal, so we'll just keep that. Um, so then you have to ask, you know, is this spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Because delta G is negative, this guy is going to be spontaneous. So this next problem also looks at the equation um, using delta G, it's delta H minus T, delta S, everything's under standard conditions, but we're not actually going to use numbers this time. We're going to kind of rationalize this um, and, and look at it more conceptually. So combustion, the combustion of propane looks like this. Um, do you expect the delta G naught to be more negative or less negative than delta H? And they don't want you to use any numbers here, they just want you to think through it. So what do we know about combustion reactions and the sign of delta H? Delta H is going to be negative, right? It's always exothermic. Whenever you have a combustion reaction, it's going to be exothermic. You can also look at the sign of delta S. So how do we figure out if entropy is increasing or decreasing? We look at the number of moles. So we have gas, right? We have six moles of gas going to seven moles of gas. So I just looked at those coefficients. So because I have, I have all gases, 
six to seven, I know that entropy is increasing. So just looking at the signs of these things, what can I what can I tell about delta G? So delta G naught. Uh, if delta H is negative, and then I'm going to subtract out, T delta S has to be positive. Uh, the temperature is always going to be in Kelvin, so it's always positive. So delta G is going to be whatever delta H is, and then I'm going to subtract out more of it. So delta G is actually going to be more negative. Delta G is more negative here than delta H. So you can do that without really looking at any specific numbers. The very last thing I want to mention in this section has to do with something where we're going to look at a lab. We're going to do a lab where we look at um, delta G. We'll calculate delta G using, um, it's a computer lab, so we'll, we'll use Spartan to do that. And you'll use Spartan again in organic chemistry, and you'll look a lot at these reaction um, profiles also in organic chemistry. So if you're looking at, and you may remember this when we talked about um, enthalpy, we've seen kind of graphs similar to this before, but now we're looking at free energy. So G here is free energy. And this is your, you know, your transition state up here. Um, this is like your, your G dagger. <laughs> that means you're in your transition state. And so if you were to measure from the reactants all the way up to this high point on the graph there, that's your delta G dagger. The Y on the graph here is your products minus reactants, right? So that's delta G. Delta G is the, you know, the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants, so products minus reactants. And if you want to figure out if this, just like when we had delta H, we were looking at is it exothermic or endothermic? You have similar terms here, except it's endergonic or exergo exergonic. Um, exergonic means delta G is negative, and endergonic means delta G is positive. So in this graph, and sometimes it's hard, it's kind of hard to read this, so I like to plug in like fake numbers. Like suppose, I know that the products are higher in energy than the reactants, so suppose the products are like at a 10 kilojoules and then this is at like five. If I did products minus reactants, I get what, 10 minus five, so I get a positive number. So this is an endergonic graph right here. This would, that, that Y right there, Right, that's why on the graph is the products minus the reactants. This would be endergonic. If you wanted to see an exergonic graph, uh, you would have reactants and then products over here. And then when you did products minus reactants, you would end up with a negative number and that would be exergonic.